Uh, but since you did mention, uh, and this is the other thing I wanted to uh, to get to, since you did mention left media and all of that, uh, it is um, it is important, I think, to uh, to talk about this uh, that we've just kind of come out of, and and the reason to this month long uh, ordeal uh, for for anybody who follows left media of uh, people, you know, what kind of at some points like really seem to me like this unhinged hate fest uh, against, uh, against AOC, against, uh, you know, Mark Pocan, uh, and against, uh, anybody who, who defended any of those, uh, any of those figures, uh, that was, um, around, that was about, uh, their, their not being willing to, to sign on to, uh, this force the vote tactic. And the reason that I bring that up isn't that I particularly want to, like rehash the like underlying merits of that particular tactic for the 10,000th time, you know, I'd, I'd actually be pretty happy uh, to, uh, to never have to talk about that again. But uh, if, if people want to know what I think, I wrote an article in Jacobin, uh, you know, if, if, if people want to know what you think, I think you just, they can do a YouTube search uh, at a Casper and force the vote and, and, and they can find out. Uh, but um uh, and it's it's all it's not even that you know I, I necessarily want to um, talk badly about any particular person who might disagree, although God knows some of them deserve it. Uh, but uh, but but I, I am interested in what this says about the state of the left right now that that could happen that we could get this like we we, we could get weeks and weeks of people, of so many people, and I understand that it's this is in a relatively limited sphere, you know, we're really talking about the online Thank left. Thank God, and, by the way. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, online left and left media uh, could be just totally consumed in this idea that, um, like, people were literally, like, circulating lists of, you know, people who hadn't, uh, you know, who weren't supporting it, uh, and, and the idea like what gets me about this is not so much whether you think that this particular like tactical idea makes sense or not. I don't, right. I, I've talked about that many times, but whatever. I mean, like if, if somebody says, look, I have this like really inside baseball wonky idea for this like parliamentary tactic, you know, that the, uh, that the squad could use gets Pelosi and it doesn't make sense to me, then whatever. That's like a very minor disagreement among, among close allies uh, about tactics. What gets me about this is that people were that ready that quickly to just completely write each other off about this, to say that anybody who, who wasn't taking, you know, what they viewed as the right position on this like extremely minor tactical debate uh, was a um, fucking sellout, you know, to, uh, to, to quote one of the main people, you know, led, led this charge. And, and what's going on there? Like, how is it that we're at a point where where this can happen that it's like that easier easy to get people to just shred into each other about this well i mean i think it's it's worth questioning what the true motivations were in the first place i think that there are and this is by the way this is totally outside of what the proposal was what the strategy was i think that having a, a thoughtful debate about it is great but when i first saw this bubbling up on Twitter, for instance. I, my first statement was about the person who proposed it, not yeah. because I decided like, oh, I'm going to be petty about this. And I'm like jealous that he proposed something. And I did. No, no. It was because I have experience with this person and I don't trust that it was really about Medicare for all. Well, if nothing uh, else. Just, yeah. yeah. I mean, if, not, if nothing else, Jimmy Dore, you know, the person we're, we're, we're talking about, I, said I didn't want to make it about people, but like I, everybody knows that much, right? They have a, uh, so uh, is somebody, I, I think there are good reasons and this is compatible with thinking that he's right. Like lots of people that I, I deeply respect, you know, thought that he was right. Uh, Cornell West thought so. I love Cornell West, right? So um, Same. the, uh, but uh, I think in, in his case, you know, you could, you could still think that he's right and think this, but I think there are pretty good reasons to suspect that uh, this is not in just about how committed he was to Medicare for all. Among other things, the fact that he supported a candidate in the primary who 
who, who did like pretty much the same thing that people like Kamala Harris and, you know, Pete Buttigieg uh, did and had this sort of triangulating like halfway in between Medicare for all and not, you know, public optiony thing. And, uh, yeah. and he did not right say that uh, Tulsi Gabbard was a fucking sellout for saying that he, kind of ran interference for her and said, well, I don't exactly agree, but there's, there's some really good things about this. And, and it's very hard for me to wrap my mind around how he could take that position then and also think that people who are hardcore supporters of Medicare for All, who have made that the center of their politics for years, uh, are terrible sellouts for not going along with his specific suggestion about how to do like a symbolic kind of theatrical uh, stunt that would supposedly advance it. Right. I, I just look, I, I think that it's worth being skeptical of people who spend the majority of their time delegitimizing and dividing the left. I think it's worth questioning what the motivations are. I think it's worth being skeptical uh, about what the majority of, you know, Jimmy Dore's content is dedicated to. I mean, it, it devolved to the point where now Humanist Report is somehow some sort of shill. I don't even know what that was about, but I don't really care. Um, <laughs> I, Humanist, by the way, Mike Figueredo is fantastic. Yeah. And I see, I see these people, I see you, I see David Dole, Mike Figueredo, whoever. You guys are an important part of getting the word out about our ideas, what we can do to strategize. Uh, I, I mean, the idea of anyone else yelling and screaming about how the DSA owes them something, how the DSA needs to cater to them. I mean, it was, ju it's just the most mind boggling thing. And, you know, one thing that I would also encourage people to do if they find themselves, you know, on the receiving end of, you know, Jimmy Dore's temper tantrums. When his uh, supporters start attacking you and harassing you and spamming you, just click on their, click on their accounts and, and try to question what their political ideology really is, right? Because um, many of those accounts I clicked on were either uh, sock puppet accounts or just full-blown Trump supporters. And I think it's important to build a broad coalition because I don't think that every single Trump supporter is a lost mm -hmm. cause. I do yeah. think that there are people in this country who, um, you know, are persuadable. And so I'm not going to write them all off. Uh, but I do question the tactic of focusing all his energy on delegitimizing uh, organizers, uh, DSA, uh, left-wing voices in the media. I mean, we're such a small group as it is. And yeah. it's so important for us to be open-minded with one another and have, you know, have these debates. I like these debates. I think it's important to debate ideas because we're not always going to agree on strategy. But the mutual respect is important. And, uh, you know, the fact that he encouraged everything to just kind of devolve into accusations of being corporate shills and being funded by like NATO, which I don't, does NATO do that? Like, does NATO fund people? <laughs> like it's just <laughs> absurd stuff. Not, and yeah, not as far, not as far as I know, uh, which, which is also, um, yeah, I, I remember at one point in this, you know, uh, that it was the big gotcha was that you'd interviewed uh, Madeline Albright win like, uh, like, so that was, it was either two years. I, so I went to the Munich security conference twice, which by the way, YouTube wanted to have a presence there. So they mm -hmm. had some of their like, uh, top YouTube personalities go and do interviews. Right. And so yeah. like the idea, like I wasn't hired by the Munich security conference to do it. There were journalists there. There was media there covering the conference as there is with every other conference in the world. Um, and YouTube wanted to have a presence. So they reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested. And so I did it two years in a row. And I have to say, like, uh, the upper hand that I usually have in these kinds of interviews is people don't know who I am. They just don't. I mean, we're talking about politicians, world leaders. And I love that they don't know who I am because typically they'll see me and they'll see like a young woman and they'll underestimate me and think I don't know anything. And then I can ask them the questions that I want to ask. Right. Madeline Albright. I don't know if it's to her credit, 
knew exactly who I was. And the second she saw me, she was, she was super spicy. Like, what are you going to ask me? Like that kind of like confrontational yeah. tone. And like, I had been preparing for the interview, really looking forward to it because I wanted to ask her about our relationship with Saudi Arabia and like the double standards when it comes to human, you know, just the excuse that yeah. we hear from the government regarding like these interventionist wars and, oh, it's a human rights crisis. And that's why we're doing it. But she threw me off because I just didn't expect it. And, um, mm -hmm. I was so like, I think in the back of my mind, I just really wanted her to answer my questions. And so I started the interview. The opening line was, it's an honor to speak with you. And I remember mm -hmm. as I said it, I cringed, but it was just to like kind of ease her into the interview so I could ask what I wanted and get an answer. Yeah, we, we're talking was, stuff like that, the, uh, the, the Saudi Arabia double standard and, and, and all of that, which I would think if NATO was paying you to, uh, to do it, they would have like, given you better instructions about what to ask about. Totally. Uh, totally. <laughs> that would have benefited them less. And, and look, I, I do think that we can make a, a distinction, you know, cause obviously you're right that, um, you know, like all 71 million or whatever it was, you know, people who voted for, uh, for Trump the, uh, the second time aren't, uh, aren't lost causes. I mean, you know, God, we better hope not. Right. But, uh, but that said, if somebody is currently a, a Trump supporter, uh, then then probably they are not yet yet in a place where they have the best interests uh, of the democratic socialist left in mind. I mean that that just that just seems pretty obvious. Um, and so you know when you when you get these people, and you know it, it's not that it's a crime necessarily even that you know to have um, people like that in in your audience, but presumably the the goal. Right, you know, if if they are right, then what you would hope for is that you're you're winning them over, uh, and and what I guess disturbed me the most about that uh, all of it, and I know a lot of people are going to hear this as tone policing, but that's really seriously not the point. It's not about tone. It's not about how polite or you rude you are when you're saying it. Uh, is that who is the fight being picked with? Right, like what what's mm -hmm. the actual fight that we're talking about? Because if you're picking a fight with Nancy Pelosi over Medicare for all, then, you know, like, yeah. Have at it. <laughs> Have at it, please. Right. You know, I love that. Um, but even though like there was a lot of talk about Nancy Pelosi because the theoretical, you know, tactic that was being suggested, you know, was about her. Uh, that's not actually who the fight was picked with. Right. Nobody was, uh, nobody was even really like, uh, doing much of anything that was directed at, uh, at Nancy Pelosi, you know, no, nobody was tweeting at Nancy Pelosi and nobody was, you know, sitting in Nancy Pelosi's office, you know, like whatever, like none of that stuff, uh, was, was happening. Uh, instead it was being uh, directed at AOC. And of course it's certainly true. Look, it's the point here is not that like AOC is infallible and there are no legitimate criticisms of her. Of course. I mean, she's, she's a politician, you know, there are, there are legitimate criticisms. I've made some of them sometimes. I, I, I think there's, there's lots of stuff that you could say about, you know, what's, um, you know, like things that she should have done differently, all that stuff. And it's not even about like, sure, pressure politicians, every politician, even, you know, even the ones who are, who are closest to you, but there is a more basic thing here, right? Which is when, when Dora was saying things like um, she's standing between you and healthcare. The point is not that it's rude. The point is not even that it's unfair to AOC. It certainly is, but that's not the, the point that I care about uh, the most. The, the point that I care about, about the most is that it's just really weirdly counterproductive because mm -hmm. like the reason that we don't have healthcare, what's standing between you and healthcare is the fact that we don't have about 200 more AOCs in Congress right now. Totally. So, yeah. Like, yeah. I, you know, it was interesting because the messaging would change depending on what the feedback and critique was toward the strategy. Uh, at first it was, no, no, we know, we know that this isn't, even if they bring it to the floor for a vote, we know it's not going to pass. Uh, but the point is to get these people, these lawmakers on the record, uh, rejecting Medicare for all so we can primary them and hold them accountable. Um, now, as I mean, you've, you've already covered this. I've already covered this. As we know, it would have failed in the Senate, which actually provides quite a bit of cover for Democrats who aren't being sincere to vote in favor of it. Um, while appearing to support it, when in reality they know it's going to fail in the Senate, they have nothing to lose. Um, but then the messaging would change to 
AOC is standing between you and your health care. But how does that make sense when you just acknowledged, you literally just acknowledged that it's not going to pass, you know it's not going to pass, and this is meant to be uh, political theater right. uh, and also to hold uh, Democratic lawmakers accountable. AOC is not the one standing between us and our health care. Uh, right. Our entire system of government and and right. the the corporate money that's injected into these congressional races that's a huge problem uh but you know it's not a sexy topic it's not right. like some uh attention grabbing click baity topic uh to talk about and like the everything that went down and by the way like again I, I don't I don't care about tone policing. I work for Jenk Uger and I get a little salty on the show too. I, I don't care about tone policing at all. I care about the substance of what's being said. I care about the unfair accusations that are being thrown in the direction of lawmakers that we have some influence over. And so when you start attacking them viciously like that, it's very easy for them to write you off. The last thing I want to do is push progressive lawmakers away from the left movement um, because we do need them. We need more of them, as you mentioned. And so uh, I, I think that it, politics is about carrots and sticks, right? right? And so uh, Jimmy Dore didn't use a stick. Jimmy Dore used like IEDs and he tried to blow up uh, the little power that progressive lawmakers have and the the amount of like influence that we have over them. Because if you're associated with that type of demonizing and, you know, uh, crazy hyperbolic rhetoric, it's easy for these lawmakers to write you off as people who aren't serious, who aren't credible. And that's the last thing that you would want. Right. Um, and so, and, and then the, also I'm sure you were frustrated with this as well, just like this unwillingness to be honest about what the actual critiques were and the unwillingness to address the actual critiques, uh, to use, you know, these straw man arguments. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you don't, uh, you know, that everybody who's against it is just saying now is not the time to fight for Medicare for all, which nobody was saying. Yeah, was no, saying ab that. yeah, absolutely. And and again, uh, the like the issue, you know, is not so much like, oh, you know, he's he's being mean, you know, to uh, to this this congressman woman. The, uh, the issue is, uh, like what's what's the strategy here? And it, and it seems like if this did have more leverage, in fact, I, as you said earlier, I, I, I'm very comforted by the thought that this was largely limited to online and you know left media spaces, uh, because if this did have a lot of purchase out of the wider world, if uh, if there were if like most people uh, who were you know who identified with a sort of Bernieish you know left agenda out in the wider world believed this, that, uh, that, uh, that the squad was the fraud squad, you know, because they weren't going along with this, you know, which was like a trending hashtag at, at one point in all of this, then the effect of that would be to tell like the people, the, the base of support of those politicians that there's no reason to support them anymore, that the, uh, that it's, it's, uh, that, um, that it's actually, there's no reason to bother about getting excited about, or, you know, to, uh, to that it's, it's just no longer important to support them against the democratic establishment because there just wasn't enough of a difference for that to matter. And that seems insanely counterproductive that if you, if you want, um, I mean, right now we have, you know, the number of members of the squad can still, even after this election, you know, be counted on your fingers uh, and uh, even the number of people who are Medicare for all co-sponsors, and, and I do agree with, you know, Jimmy Dore that um, some of them are, are, I'm sure some of them are very soft yes votes who, who would get cold feet if they thought that it was actually even going to pass the House, never mind, like you said, you know, make it to the Senate. Uh, I'm not sure why, like, exposing soft yes votes should actually be a priority right now as opposed to uh, dramatically expanding the number of those votes. And then also building the kind of movement that could eff effectively, like what you'd want is enough people who are like hardcore AOC types that you could get within spitting distance of actually passing it and then build up enough of a grassroots movement that you could effectively pressure the soft yes votes to, to stick to their guns when, when it came to it. That would you know be what would make sense to me anyway. But then like, yeah, yeah like the idea 
that you tell people this, that, oh, this is the fraud squad. You know, there's really, there's really no important reason to support, you know, Bernie crap politicians like this. Like that is a gift to Nancy Pelosi because, because, mm-hmm. because if the, if people really buy it, right. If they, if they really think that, uh, that, oh, there's actually no difference between these politicians and the democratic establishment, then why would you support them? You know, why would you support other primary challengers, you know, who, who are going to be aligned with them, who are going to be similar to them. And, and that just seems like a really basic point, but then you think, why is it? And again, not talking about what whether like the tactic was a good tactic or not, uh, you know I don't think so. I don't think it was, but you know, but that's that's a that's a debate that again I'm very happy to have, like have that just as like a friendly debate, you know, among people who basically agree with each other, but you know might have different ideas about tactics. But like the thing that gets me is that we're in a place, you know, post Bernie, all that stuff, where you could have. Sure, it's a small minority, I'm sure, of the base of these politicians. It's mostly concentrated online and left media spaces. But still, right, like a lot of uh, of the, the most hardcore supporters uh, of, um, you know, people who had been Bernie supporters, etc., like a lot of the most, you know, most hardcore group, people who are very online, uh, who are, are – willing to just orient everything totally around this for a month. And that seems like all I can think, and and I want you to take out this, all I can think is that we just don't have like a big obvious thing to rally around right now. The way that the way that the Bernie campaign was a big obvious thing for the left to rally around right now. So anything that seemed like that felt like, a some, like something that was big and dramatic that everybody could rally around. Uh, a lot of people were were willing to do it. And in fact, like super hostile when anybody uh, when anybody brought up any problems with it because I think they were sort of relieved and happy to uh, to have something to rally around. So I guess the question is just how are like I'm sure people will forget about force the vote. Like I'm sure that like by like you know two months from now most people will like barely remember that this is the thing that exists. Cause that's how hashtag activism works that, you know, but like right. the, everybody has the memory of a goldfish about this, but so I guess I'm not worried about that, but I am worried that we're going to keep doing this because like we, we, we don't, yeah, the, the same problem isn't going anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think your analysis on that is right. I mean, I think what, and I don't begrudge, well-meaning people who feel lost and angry and, and, you know, don't know where to direct their energy, uh, to be sure organizing is a difficult process that takes time. And so when you see so many people suffering, uh, during this pandemic, when you notice that there isn't like a, a robust effort by our lawmakers to provide healthcare to Americans during this time of crisis. Yeah, it's it's infuriating. And what Force the Vote did was provide like this heated blanket on a super cold winter morning, right? right? It was just comforting for some people. And I get that. And I don't begrudge them for, for wanting to kind of latch on to something, even if some of them, um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not talking about public figures here. I'm talking about, uh, you know, people who genuinely want these policies passed, um, you know, latching onto this and, and really, really uh, refusing to listen to any critique of it. It is what it is. I'm, I'm not upset about that. But I do think, I do think that, you know, I just think that there's like this lack of, well, we live in a society that has conditioned us to expect instant gratification. So I think that's an issue. Um, People are just conditioned that way. And so they want quick solutions, but there are no shortcuts, especially when it comes to really changing this entire political system in a way that represents the best interests of workers as opposed to the elites. Um, And the most, look, you can call me whatever bad name you want. I mean, I've been doing this for 14 years. I've been called every bad name. I've been accused of all sorts of insane things. This isn't about me. But what was really like horrifying to experience and witness was the 
insane cruelty toward organizers and members of the DSA. I mean, it is such a thankless job already to do what they're doing. And it's a difficult job to do what they're doing. It's an unpaid job to do what they're doing. But they do it anyway because they understand, you know, based on historical events, the only way you get what you want is through this organizing, through these pressure campaigns. Uh, you're not going to get it done through boycotts or hashtag activism. None of that works. It's the it's the people on the ground who are doing the hard work right. and it can be demoralizing. And I just, I really hope none of them were discouraged or became discouraged or demoralized based on um, the attacks that they had to deal with during that whole situation. Um, I worried about them, honestly, because I want them to keep fighting. I want them to keep organizing. I want DSA's numbers to continue increasing. Um, and it's not, and not just DSA, any, anyone who's yeah. part of, you know, this project, uh, people who do not get validated it, yeah, you know, yeah, on a daily yeah. basis. So. Yeah, National Nurses United, uh, the exactly. uh, which, which have probably done more than any other single organization to advance Medicare for all, uh, and um, the uh, yeah, Justice Democrats, you know, recruiting you know primary challengers for Democrats who actually are against you know Medicare for all who who are vulnerable to that, you know, in uh, in districts where that's true, people who are involved in uh, labor unions, you know, who who can be. Uh, who can help to uh, that aren't necessarily, you know, uh, prioritizing Medicare for all right now, who can help make that happen.